Welcome to Pasadena Monthly. I'm your host, Justin Chapman. Thanks for being here. Happy Native American Heritage Month. After taking a look at what's been going on in Pasadena this past month, we'll speak with our guest, Lena Kennedy. But before we get started, let's check out these Pasadena media news briefs. The City of Pasadena's solar program is designed to enable customers to receive credit for surplus energy they supply to the electric grid. The system was established in 2008 with a paper application system and solar rebates. In 2013, the program began its transition to an online application system and upgraded to an online portal in 2018. Since the beginning, the program has seen significant growth. By 2022, the city's solar capacity was 23.4 megawatts. 96% of these installations were in the residential sector. Improvements continue this year with a new online application process, which helps expedite the solar installation process. The Pasadena Water and Power website has been revised and updated, making it easier for customers to navigate the solar program. For more information about the Pasadena Solar Program, visit pwpweb.com solar. The Duda Parade is back by popular demand. The Pasadena Duda Parade embraces eccentric, an often irreverent satire, and is known as the twisted sister of the more conventional Rose Parade. This year, the parade returns on November 19th, kicking off at 11 a.m., and it returns to its original parade route, turning down Colorado Boulevard and ending in Old Pasadena. The official after party is at the Old Town Pub, entering at 34 East Holly Street with live music and a $5 cover. The parade is free and anyone can attend. To sign up and be in the parade, or to have fun as a volunteer, or just learn more about the parade's fascinating and confusing history, visit Pasadena Duda Parade.info. Let's do da. The first in a series of sneak peek previews of the 2024 Rose Parade floats has been released. The theme for the 2024 Rose Parade is celebrating a world of music, and that theme has been reflected in these official renderings for these float participants. The American Armenian Rose Float Association, the City of Burbank, Explore Louisiana, one Legacy, Donate Life, Pasadena Humane, and Hills Pet Nutrition, and the UPS Store. Join us on January 1st to see these wonderful floats and more for the 135th Rose Parade. Let's turn next to our lightning round of news updates. One, the Pasadena City Council appointed 11 residents to a new Charter Reform Study Task Force. Those members are Lena Kennedy, our guest later in the show today, Margaret McAustin, Marcus Hatcher, Paul Novak, Liberty McCoy, Ken Chalkins, Andy Wilson, Vince Farhat, Raul Francisco Salinas, Jackie Robinson Baisley, and Diana Carbajal Mejia. The group will study the city's charter, which is like its constitution, and issue a report to the council in May or June 2024. The council will then consider those recommendations and decide whether to put amendments to the charter on the November 2024 ballot before the deadline, which is August 5th, 2024. The task force will study issues such as the council's vacancy appointment process, including special elections, vice mayoral appointments, timing of mayoral elections, council term limits, council compensation and family care benefits, and council com uh, campaign contribution limits. City staff will also consider making recommendations to relevant council committees regarding more technical changes, such as updating accounting terminology related to transfers from the annual light and power funds to the general fund, increasing procurement limits before council approval is required, and minor corrections throughout the charter. Two, the nominated peri period for Pasadena elections for mayor and council districts 1, 2, 3, 4, and 6 is now open through December 8th. However, if an incumbent does not file papers by the deadline, it will be extended to December 13th. Candidates for office must collect 25 signatures, 50 for mayoral candidates, and pay a $25 fee to qualify for the election. Papers for city offices are available in the office of the city at City Hall. All of the incumbents and several challengers have already pulled papers. The election will be March 5th, 2024. Three, the city council increased the amount of its contract with Daniel Davidson to $79,680, with California Emergency Solutions and Housing Grant Funds for consulting services for the 2024 point-in-time homeless count, which will be conducted January 23rd and 24th and also needs volunteers. Also, I'm sad to report that Dorothy Edwards, a formerly unhoused Pasadena resident turned homelessness advocate whose story of recovery from drug addiction inspired the community, 
passed away from cancer late last month. She was 65. When she accepted city services and housing, she got sober and began working for such organizations as Housing Works, and she proudly served on the National Board of Directors for the Corporation for Supportive Housing. She was also inaugural graduate of the organization's Speak Up Advocacy Training Program and was named Congressional Woman of the Year by Congressmember Judy Chu. I had the pleasure of meeting and inter interviewing Dorothy back in 2019 for an article I wrote for Passing a Weekly. She told me, quote, when you're homeless for a long time, you feel like you're less than and not enough. But Bill Wong, Pasadena Housing Director, and Sean Morrissey, a fellow advocate, always made me feel welcome. I'm really a stronger person today because of the encouragement I had. It's important what I'm doing. My voice is important, and I know in my heart that I've found my passion. Now I want to pay it forward and help those who are still on the street. Four, Council has hired a historian with a $200,000 contract to produce a report about the communities that were displaced as a result of Caltrans building the 710 stub in West Pasadena. The historian, Allegra Consulting, also plans to conduct oral and video interviews with displaced individuals and their descendants. Two other firms, Architectural Resources Group and Regents of UCLA, will work on two other aspects of the project, historical data setting and impacts of freeways on segregation in Pasadena, respectively. The city also is moving forward with its acquisition and sale of 17 vacant Caltrans properties, including contracting with security, property inspection, and broker listing services. Five, the Pasadena Unified School District will hold two community forums for residents to provide input on what they want in a new superintendent. The first will be on November 29th at 6 p.m. at Muir High School, and the second will be on November 30th at 5.30 p.m. at Pasadena High School. PUSD is aiming to release applications in January, conduct interviews in April, and, and start the new superintendent's tenure on July 1st. Also, after multiple bargaining sessions, PUSD said it reached an impasse in negotiations with the United Teachers of Pasadena. However, the union's president said the union does not agree that there is an impasse and expressed skepticism that, that the district can't afford the union's demands. Meanwhile, PCC faculty members voted to stay in their existing faculty association rather than decertify and join the much larger California Federation of Teachers Union, which Art Center faculty voted to join earlier this year. Six, the city's planning department has launched its Historic Places Pasadena Completing Our Story project, which will create a comprehensive written history of Pasadena, highlighting the significant historic places that have played pivotal roles in the city's development. The goal is to identify historic resources within the city that have not already been officially designated. Seven, the city council voted to direct the city attorney to draft an ordinance that will integrate the rental housing board as a city department known as the rent stabilization department. That ordinance will come back to the council within 60 days for a vote, come back to the council in 12 months for a review, and sunset after 24 months. The Rental Housing Board then approved job descriptions for the department director and staff. The board recommended that Philip LeClaire, the city's current information and Techno technology department director, be the interim director of the rent stabilization department. The board also approved just cause eviction policies. Eight, the city took formal ownership of a former Kaiser Permanente building on a two and a half acre property at Lake Avenue and Villa Street in partnership with LA County. The goal is to transform the property into a community services and housing site that offers 100 affordable housing units, mental health care services, and primary outpatient services. Nine, Governor Gavin Newsom signed SB 96 into law, the Historic Venue Restoration and Resiliency Act which enables California's historic venues, including the Rose Bowl, to receive and reinvest a percentage of the sales and use tax revenue they generate from certain events to fund improvement projects, capital infrastructure, preservation, retrofitting, and ADA improvements. And 10, City Council approved the Pasadena Police Department to use a federal grant to buy a specialized facility called a shoot house that simulates real life scenarios in a controlled environment to help police officers train, refine, and safely practice de-escalation techniques. Also, Pasadena's independent police audit auditor, Dr. Richard Rosenthal, who was our guest on this show last month, will visit Pasadena again on December 12th and 13th to meet with the community and to monitor and assess police department firearms and crowd control training. And finally, the LA County Board of Supervisors approved a $700,000 settlement with KPCC reporter Josie Wong because sheriff's deputies violated her First Amendment rights when they tackled and arrested her while lawfully covering a protest in 2020 following the murder of George Floyd. 
It is believed to be the largest settlement of its kind, and it also requires that deputies receive training on press rights. Let's patch in our guest, Lena Kennedy. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me, Justin. Lena is the founder and conference director of the SoCal Women's Conference and Expo and the leader and owner of L. Kennedy and Associates Consulting, a firm that specializes in community and strategic consensus building strategies for executives, policymakers, and political candidates. She has worked with numerous candidates and elected officials, including President Barack Obama, Congresswoman Judy Chu, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, Congressman Adam Schiff, Reverend Jesse Jackson, LA Mayors Karen Bass and Tom Bradley, and many more. She served as one of the national vice chairs for the Democratic National Committee, co-chair of the National Women's Leadership Initiative, and on the boards of numerous organizations, including the Pasadena Arts Council, ChapCare, First AME Church, and Pasadena NAACP. So Alina, you've obviously had an illustrious career, uh, not only locally, but but nationally as well. Before we dive into some of the, the local issues, tell us about your 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 uh, role in in at the DNC, uh, your your work with the Obamas and some of these political campaigns. Well, <laughs> let me say, I laugh because you said an illustrious career. It was a lot of hard work in <laughs> doing all the things I do. When we volunteer, as all of us know, it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. But I was, I was privileged to serve as the vice chair of the Democratic National Convention, and I worked alongside chairperson at that time, Debbie Watzerman Schultz. Mm -hmm. And it was a role that I believe was entrusted to me because of my notable contributions. I was the highest Black fundraiser in the United States for President Candidate Barack Obama, and it was written up in the Wall Street Journal. And additionally, I gained attention as one of the most effective volunteer directors during that time. And I think that my approach to my work has always been deeply rooted in a deep love for this country and a genuine desire to make a meaningful impact regardless of one's position. Oftentimes we think we have to be super wealthy or high status. And I firmly believe that you maximize the potential where you are in the space that you are that you are in and you focus on the Tangible, tangible results that you can make and the difference you can make. And subsequently, I was later honored to be appointed by President Obama to the Kennedy Center. And that was an experience that I truly was humbled and it was an enriching par part of my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, and and you also, of course, bring the same passion to the local community issues as you do to this this national work. So what are, what are some of the the uh, the most important local issues in Pasadena to you right now. What what uh, do we as a community need to be focusing on? And and as sort of a follow up to that, I notice you're just appointed to the the charter reform uh, task force. So what are you hoping comes out of that process? Well, well, to, I I'm not going to be able to answer what do I expect to come out of that other than good work. Mm -hmm. Once we dive into it and understand what the council members have identified areas of focus, then we can come to some position of putting together a concrete work plan and how we engage the community to get a good product at the end. Um, local politics is really critical and it impacts our daily lives. Um, and the passion that I bring is that I appreciate how we have multiple perspectives in our community, but we're able to oftentimes come together and have some tough conversations. And I think when we're electing local elected officials and national elected officials, I think we have a huge responsibility to each other, to our cities and to our country, our county and our state. And that responsibility is that we all have to do our homework. We need to ask the tough questions. Oftentimes I have been known to be confronted because I may not be supporting someone that people think I should support. I do not support people based on their national nationality because I'm black. I don't necessarily support someone that is black, but I look at their approach. I look at their track record. I look at the history of what they've accomplished and how they have treated all people, particularly people that look like me. And if you look like me and you don't treat people like me fairly, 
you don't get my vote. And I think we all have that responsibility to look at and understand the track record and how these elected officials have a great level of influence. And we need to shed light on their inept when they're running and ask the tough questions so that we can get the best candidate possible to sit and represent us. I don't know if that answered your question about local politics, but. Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, I, I don't know if there, there's other, uh, um, uh, we can get in some other non-political community issues as well, but I wanna ask about um, um, uh, your brother, uh, John J. Kennedy, Tell us about his legacy. How should he be remembered by the Pasadena community? Well, I th my brother, he was, um, he was absolutely incredible. And I think that he left a mark on this community through his remarkable leadership that will forever be remembered. And I will do everything I can to make sure that he is always remembered. He possessed, I feel he possessed an extraordinary ability to comprehend the community's needs and he envisioned a brighter future. He wanted one Pasadena. He talked about that all the time where he represent one of the most complicated districts. And it was complicated because it had a little piece of everybody. It had people that were renters, people that didn't have higher education. Then it had people that had higher. It was a complex community. But he did that with passion and he led with both. He was so compassionate about the community and he had a sound mind. And I think that John made decisions that were rooted and grounded in truth. And he had a genuine concern for the well being of our community. His dedication of service to on the Pasadena City Council was reflected deeply in his deep commitment by recognizing the responsibility that came with serving. John invested a significant amount of time in educating his colleagues because when you come to a board and you don't have someone that's willing to take a risk to bring up issues that are uncomfortable, it's hard, but he emphasized the importance of being the mindfulness and awareness of unconscious bias. And we all bring unconscious bias to the table, but that impacts the decisions that we make. And I think when I look at the council meetings, he spent time just educating his colleagues on unconscious biases. Mm -hmm. And his legacy should be remembered as that of a compassionate and insightful leader who tirelessly worked towards creating a more inclusive and harmonious community. And, and and one of the issues he championed, of course, uh, early on before anybody else was um, uh, civilian oversight of the police department, right? Yes, yes. He was a champion of that. And he also, uh, when nobody, what was interesting about that before the NAACP and some of these other affinity groups jumped on board, he was already addressing that issue years prior to that hmm. because he understood the importance of creating a community that was fair and just and right for all. And when things happen nationally, good, bad, or indifferent, they become what I call sexy. When George Floyd, as devastating as it was, was murdered, it was the sexy topic. All corporations wanted to become inclusive. All of these affinity groups, such as the NAACP and others, wanted to jump on the bandwagon to say, this is what we need to do. And it was difficult for me as a sister and having a personal commitment to my brother to watch those things happen. And some of those entities act as if John had been doing nothing. And he had been fighting the good fight since day one of sitting on that city, city council, not only with police oversight, but wanting to get an Africa Pasadena sister city. There were so many things that he fought for and believed in, but he wanted to just create equity and create one Pasadena. And he did it tirelessly and he didn't look for the glory. He didn't mind that other affinity groups came and said they did it. He just wanted the job done. 
Yeah, and 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 the sister city is extremely important, of course, as well. That he he really spearheaded uh, the 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 first sister city uh, relationship uh, on the African continent with Dakar Plateau, Senegal. Uh, tell us about the importance of that relationship to Pasadena, and and also is the, is the sister cities uh, a program being utilized and understood and appreciated as much as it could and should be. Good question. The importance is this started by a president of the United States of America, President Eisenhower. Mm -hmm. The Pasadena Sister City is the only nonprofit from my research that really represents the city of Pasadena internationally. And I'm not talking about the Tournament of Roses. That's not controlled by the city. The Pasadena sister city has a great amount of control by the city because in order for us to have a sister city in another country, the city council has to vote and approve that. And mm -hmm. then they have to meet with that city mayor and they have to sign an agreement. We're the only nonprofit that does that. And John saw the bigger picture. That's one thing about Mr. Kennedy. The vision he had, the insight he had was just massive. It was sometimes over the top and sometimes too much for people to process. Just with his turkey giveaway, as I'm redoing and continuing that legacy, and I looked at, he was giving away 1,500 turkeys and the cost wow. that was involved, and then he was giving away gift cards. But that's how he operated. So with the Pasadena Sister City and the Africa Sister City, he saw the vision, the economic development opportunities, the mm -hmm. educational opportunities, the exchange between ideas in businesses and with our students and with the different cities of how we can work together and bring about a harmonious world. That was the vision. And that was one of his campaign uh, initiatives that he was going to ensure that we had uh, Africa's sister city. And he did it. He fulfilled the things that he's committed to do. Uh -huh. Absolutely. And, and, so, and, and another the one. Other, the other piece to that question that you asked that I think is important, mm -hmm. we have someone now in Car Synagogue, one of our representatives from our sister city. We have over 120 active members and we're engaging in the community. We're very involved in the community. And we want to have every single one of our six sister cities building on what has been happening for the last 75 years and growing and developing relationships. And we hope to have more sister cities as we move forward. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, everyone should get, get more involved with that. that that's really a, a citywide uh, a project, as you mentioned. Um, and then, of course, uh, the other uh, major project um, that just finally got completed uh, uh, last month or opened last month that John fought for for so many years it was the community pool uh, at Robinson Center. Tell us about why that project meant so much to, to John and, and what it means to have it, it named after him. Well, one of the projects, as you know, that that it, it really cons it was he was consumed with dedication for numerous of years when he was renovating, um, having overseen that and had that commission that renovated Robinson Park mm -hmm. and the basketball court, that was those were the items that were a part of the completion of doing the field. The field was done under the former council member. Robinson Center and the basketball was under Mr. Kennedy. In the master plan, those were the only other two items that were to be completed. But when he looked at it, he said, we cannot call this completed unless we have a pool. Mm -hmm. And the council members, as we all know, said, no, John, it's not going to happen. We don't have $5 million. It wasn't a part of the plan. Sorry, John. John was dedicated in establishing and making sure that there was a pool at Robinson Park. At the vision to materialize it, and he wasn't going to stop until it happened. 
And I think the endeavor, this endeavor of making this happen was significant because not only is it a message to having a pool, it should be a message to all young people that having the tenacity and being committed to something, you can get the results. And he had a profound, significant commitment to this. And he was, he was the champ, he was the sole champion. He was the sole champion of making this happen. Yeah, he that's that's a uh, yeah, that's he John wanted, in, in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah, he wanted he he really wanted the black and brown community to have a aquatic center that was in their community, mm -hmm. and as you know, and many of the people in our community know that John stood alone. Alone, he stood alone with that, and he was, but he had unwavering determination. And thank God that Supervisor Catherine Barger put up the first half a million dollars to make that happen. And then they were able, he was able to work with his colleagues to ensure that they found other funding to make that project happen. So I'm excited about having his name listed on that because it is so deserving to have Mr. Kennedy's name on there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, it, I mean, his loss is, is a, uh, you know, a deep loss for the, the entire community. Uh, that's going to be felt for a long time, I think. Um, and so, of course, my my condolences condolences to to you and your family. I'm sure that uh, that difficulty of that loss never goes away. And so, um, you know, I just I just want to thank you for for coming on the show and and telling us about John and, and his legacy and his work for the community, and also also your work for for the the Pasadena community and uh, and nationally. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on and telling us about it. Thank you so very much for having me. Before we go, here is this month in Pasadena history. Speaking of amending the charter, it was this month in 1998 when Pasadena voters approved a charter amendment to implement citywide mayoral elections. Before then, Pasadena's mayor was a rotating position among city council members. And before that was known as the, as the city council starting in 1993 among the city's board of directors. The first mayoral election was held in March 1999, with a runoff in April 1999 between Chris Holden and Bill Bogard, who was elected. Thank you all so much for joining me for this episode of Pasadena Monthly. Tune in every fourth Friday of the month at 5 p.m. Learn more at PasadenaMedia.org and JustinDouglasChapman.com. Drop me a line at jchapman at cityofpasadena.net. See you next time.